Hello, everybody, and welcome to Virtual Trek Con with Sirach Lofton, of course. Hello. My name, my name is Ryan T. Huss. Today, we have a very special guest, best known as a refugee <laughs> from Eagle Moss. Mr. Ben Robinson is here all the way from the UK. Hey, Ben. Hey. How are you today? Oh, I'm good, actually. Surprisingly good. I don't know why I'm surprised, but it, you know, it, it just feel kind of positive <laughs> and cheerful, and yeah, I don't know why, but it's good. It's good. Better than the alternative. Mm -hmm. uh, can we? Well, right now people are saying, "Wait a second, that's the Eagle Moss guy." So I guess we just have to go. Let's just start there and then go back to the beginning. After that, <laughs> what did you do in Eagle Moss? Um, I did lots and lots of stuff, mostly ships. So we made. Over, over, just under four hundred different little model starships, which is crazy when you come to think of it. I think when we started, there was something like you could get maybe like ten or fifteen different designs. By the time we finished, we'd done the concepts that people threw away and didn't want to do. Um, so that, and then we did a load of books that went with it. Um, yeah. Well, so we did. Uh, going back to the beginning, stuff when I started out on the Star Trek Fact Files, we did books that collated some of that material. We did big encyclopedias of starships. I wrote a book about Voyager and a book about the original series. And I was about to do one about Deep Space. Um, Hang on then, a second. A <laughs> about to? What happened? Uh, Eagle Moss went bust, went bankrupt, left not just owing fans money, but staff money um so yeah my my sort of um 12 years of running geeky geeky collectible kind of stuff at least from the creative side i wasn't responsible for the business side and i was just an employee um just kind of disappeared so yeah that happened six months ago mm -hmm. so, yeah time has been a little bit of a blur since then <laughs> um so ben you you've been kind of behind the scenes doing a lot of things um uh, in the Star Trek world for those people that are not aware, you know, what you've done. And I'm just fascinated by the amount of impact that you've had in the space in so many different areas. Um, mm. Can you talk about uh, Star Trek magazine a little bit? Way back when. So, well, I've got to go back a tiny bit before that. So the very first thing I worked on, I, I answered a job for someone who knew a little bit about publishing and a lot about Star Trek. Uh, and I've been working, that was, <laughs> I've been working in publishing for about two, three years at that point. And okay. uh, there was enough Star Trek that you could know a lot about it. Um, and that job turned out to be on the Star Trek Fact Files, which was uh, this UK thing. It was like a um, memory alpha that you got 32 pages a week and put in binders um and it was such a big deal by the time we finished people were buying sheds to put the binders in and they were like saying oh please stop please stop because there's no more room in my shed were these uh, like in um, magazine form i this is new to me yeah so they were what would happen is that you would get a block of 32 pages um and they were like glued glued down the spine and you'd pull the pages apart and there'd be some pages about technology. There'd be some pages about characters. There's like a Jake Sisko section. Um, and then you had these different binders with dividers and you would put them between the dividers in the right place. And then the next week you'd get another 32 pages and you'd do it all again. Um, and I think it ran for over 300 issues. So there was like over 9,000 pages of stuff in there. Um, and we did loads and loads of illustrations, which you see all over the internet now. So all those well, are isometric like, drawings of rooms, that's us. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm envisioning like um, government classified files type of, you know, <laughs> is it, was it kind of like that? Exactly. Uh, well, no, we, well, there were lots of people <laughs> Section them, so they weren't very classified. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, the feel of it was like, oh, I've got the intel on Jake yeah, Sisko. Absolutely. And, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, yes, it was a combination of... Of, there was lots of techie stuff so we had like you know blueprint line drawings of all the ships and stuff and then there would be um you know you'd get and i don't know in week 12 you'd get to jake cisco it would be jake and ben cisco his relationship with his father and then you know a month or two later you might get uh, jake cisco journalist or something like that and then it would sort of talk about all the the you know different things that jake had done or whoever had done and there were like I mean, there were literally thousands of, of entries in this thing. Um, and then when it came to us doing that 
if we wanted to, that was sold in the UK and we wanted to sell it in the US. And we were told that in order to do that, we would have to take a bigger license because Simon and Schuster, who published the tech manual and the encyclopedia and all that kind of stuff, had the pure reference license. So we then did the US magazine, which meant for four years, um, I could talk to anybody I wanted to and write about anything I wanted to do uh, in Star Trek. And I got to know a lot of people that way. Wow. Yeah, I, I remember um, getting the Star Trek magazine and and that would be a reference guide for me just to get some information about... Tell you what the writers were thinking that they hadn't told you. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. A little bit. And some of the concepts, ideas where they started, because you got a lot of that too, uh, concept yeah. art and things like that I was into. Mm-hmm. Um, also the costume design and aliens. You guys went into real detail with um, Star Trek. And, uh, uh, you know, so I have I have myself a whole stack of Star Trek magazine, which I was saying at some point, please stop making these because I, I don't know where to put all of these. <laughs> Sir Ox a collector. Okay. Yeah, they yeah. are. I still have them on my shelf. I oh, great, yeah. Great flattery when you hear that people still have them. Wow. Uh, oh, yeah, I still have mine. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah, I mean, it was, the great thing about it is that for me, what I'd always been fascinated by was the whole the behind the scenes stuff. So, uh, you know, being able to to talk to concept artists, to talk to production designers, uh, talk to writers, whatever, and, and just sort of find out why things were the way they were, which has always been my, my thing. It's not just what, but why. You know, so yeah, we. I interviewed uh, Matt Jeffries. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, this is twenty years ago. So there are loads of people are no longer with us who I was able to talk to. I became mm-hmm. some people were like, you know, I got on with really well, and like I used to call Ira because of the time difference. So in the UK, you're eight hours. We're eight hours ahead of you guys in LA. And mm-hmm. what would happen is most people, you'd be like, okay. I'll phone you at six my time would be 10 your time or five and nine, whatever that's cool. I was like, no, no, no. Call me, get up early. Call me at seven o'clock in the morning, your time. I'll have watched the news. I'll have a drink and we can talk. And I would. That's I would, my would, flavor. A lot of times cool. when I'm working with people in the UK, I'll just say, you know, you can just call me at like eight or nine in the morning, your time. I'll be. I'm still up and working. It's easy. It would be nice and quiet <laughs> around the neighborhood. It's a good time. But I would be dragging myself out of bed seven o'clock in the morning. And the first thing, <laughs> you know, you go, I mean, you know, seven o'clock in the morning, first thing you're doing is talking to Ira, who can be quite demanding. You know, <laughs> he is not some kind of lazy pushover kind of like uh, easy interview. And we would have like these, you know, great conversations. We'd talk about stuff. Because I think it was the first time he'd really stopped and talked about stuff like over the whole series. You know, he's so busy trying to get the show done that actually stopping to think about it mm-hmm. um, and to talk so about you, So you did, you did a lot of interviews um, mm. during the course of this time. Um, I read that, uh, you know, some one among some of your interesting interviews was Leonard Nimoy. Uh, what was that like? That was That was freaky. That was the very first interview that I did. So you have this oh, whole wow. thing, like, you know, important people, you don't get their phone number. This is when there was a phone number rather than a Zoom call, you know. You don't get their phone number. They they have to call you. So you give them the number and you sit there. And, I, you know, I'm this, I don't know what, 27, 28, and I'm sitting there waiting for this call. And, you know, you pick up the phone and it says, this is Leonard Nimoy. And you're like, yeah, I know. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> And actually, he was, he was, I was, I don't think there's anybody I could have, have had as a better first interview because he was incredibly engaged um, and really friendly and funny. Um, I remember asking him, he, you know, he told the story about the Vulcan salute being the, the, the blessing from the priest that he, you know, mm-hmm. shouldn't have watched when he was a kid. And I said, so are Vulcans all secretly Jewish? And he, he laughed. And I was, oh my God, I made Leonard Nimoy laugh. So that was, that was phenomenal. And he also, I mean, Leonard also had, he had this extraordinary memory. So other people, you're like, you know, da, 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 okay. uh, yeah. I mean, George Takei, George Takei, I actually have a piece of tape with George saying, you know, Ben, I don't actually remember being in Star Trek. <laughs> and, uh... <laughs> yeah, what was it uh, Walter Koenig famously uh, said? He said, I don't remember much, but I remember a lot of colorful shirts. <laughs> <And that's... laughs> 
All right. Well, <laughs> Leonard remembered. Brad Leonard remembered what the weather was like, and you know, I mean, he he wow. really, I genuinely believed him that he 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 absolutely remembered. You know, incredible detail. So. You know, you learn as you go on and you do all these interviews that people don't always remember or that, you know, they'll start telling you something and you're thinking, that's, I know that's not what happened. <laughs> you're remembering this, you know. Um, <laughs> but Leonard was, a, you know, a great start because he he did, he did really remember everything and, uh, and, and he was very kind. So that, that was, that was a, a lovely start. Um, mm-hmm. Couldn't have been better. You know, uh, Ben, with every answer you give, like eight or nine other questions pop up in my head that I want to ask you because you you're like an encyclopedia. Uh, do they have encyclopedias in the UK? I'm just kidding. Oh, wait, well, it was uh, in fact the Star Trek <laughs> Fact Files was a pull apart right. file encyclopedia. <laughs> you were the yeah. first memory alpha. That's right. Um, yeah. But what really grabbed my attention was when you said that you always wondered about the why. Mm. For for me personally, and I think for most Star Trek fans. We start off focusing on episodes and actors. And when we want to go to our first convention, it's because, whoa, Riker's going to be there. Captain Sisko's going to be there. You know, Oda, what? Uh, but now, as as we get to learn more and more and more, we start to go, oh, this writer is interesting. And this producer. And did you know about this, this DP? And then we start going even deeper, <clears throat> excuse me, and the people behind them and that seems like the evolution of fandom in a lot of ways, but it sounds like you were there from the beginning. You were always looking at the behind the scenes stuff. And I'm kind of curious if you even know where that came from. I, I kind of do because my father was a television director and my grandfather was a, a minorly famous production designer. Um, he did all the hammer films. Um, so I, I, I always came to things from the point of view of knowing that there was someone that made it, if that makes sense. I know that mm-hmm. sounds yeah. a stupid thing to say, but I mean, I, I, I knew enough to know that people would ask the wrong people questions. So people would say, Oh, why did this happen? Or why did that happen? And they'd ask an actor and in the nicest possible way, you, you guys are the last to find out, you know, you get the script. Um, you don't get the decisions as to why this has happened to your character or why this is is happening. It's the writers in the writing room who who've made those just made those choices or who have, you know, maybe thought about doing something different mm. and then decided to change tag. And I don't think I, I don't think people necessarily knew who to ask, if that makes sense, or or what to ask. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, or like with the you know the, the concept art and stuff like that i mean you once you know it exists and you start seeing all these reams and reams of art and you're straight away you're seeing this like oh it could have been so different it could have been like this it could have been it, it could have been this totally different version i mean one of the things i love is alternate casting you know so you know steve mcgarrett was down to be captain kirk or um or you know or lloyd bridges was their first choice um mm-hmm. or know, we just we just might have been Eric data. Minyak. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. We, just, we just talked with him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Eric went quite a long way down that road. I mean, he and Brent were right down to the end. Mm-hmm. Um, or in fact, I mean, I talked to um Joe Diagosta, and he was saying that he strongly wanted them to cast Mark Leonard as Spock rather than Leonard Nemo. Wow. Um, so you know they wanted this... a Leonard for sure, though. Yeah. Yeah, that much yeah, thing exactly. no. <laughs> With or without no. <laughs> right. And they wanted to have a character named Leonard too. Leonard McCoy, right? They're like, we just yeah. want it Leonard. Every we just like Leonard. <laughs> Leonard is good. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but then um, but then you also see that like those uh, those actors turn up again in the show. So like Eric comes in to play the traveler or or you know, Mark yes. Leonard comes in to play the Roman commander and then Sarah. Or for example, so, real quick, Tim Russ, who was one of the finalists to play Jordy, uh, mm. they just kept bringing him back they brought him in a, in mm. starship mine on the next generation and then he eventually of course became uh tuvok but yeah absolutely when they f- see someone they like on deep space nine too right he was in an episode of deep space a nine. klingon you're right yeah yeah I forgot about that mm-hmm. yeah when they um, see someone they the, like who they was stick the woman with them. that they originally were going to pick for janeway i thought uh didn't they oh, well, well, Jean-Pierre Jean-Pierre Rougeau Rougeau. actually started filming um, yeah yeah and then after a day she's like i don't think this is for me i think you've made a mistake well, mm-hmm. um, I wonder if she regrets that decision. 
Probably uh, not. Uh, it was not. It by all accounts, it was not a good fit. From everything I've seen and read and heard, it was extremely mutual and extremely clear that it was not a good fit. And if you see the side by side, you know, like first episode with Jean Viev, yeah. a Canadian actress, I believe, and then you compare it to the first episode with uh, Mulgrew, you you kind of just say, okay, yes, fine, I get it, I see it, I get yeah. it. And Kate Mulgrew, to her credit, took that role. And she did not let anybody take it away from her. Or, you know, she basically was like, I could be on pro on a probationary period for as long as you want, but you're yeah. never going to take this role from me. You can stand there till you're blue in the face, but you're never going to find any reason that I'm not uh, Captain Janeway. So she did it. But yeah. Real quick, back on on Star Trek, uh, the magazine. Yes. Barack, you said you had a ton of those. Ben, you mm -hmm. obviously also have a ton. But I was on the cover of one uh, issue. Uh, too, so. I'm going to find thank, that. Thank, find yes, that yes please. Thank that, you, Ben. Yes. I'm trying to remember which issue. I'll send it along. Uh, that's um, the one I have plenty of copies of. So <laughs> <laughs> you should sign those. No, but you know, back in the day when those were coming out, to me, and it's all about perspective, that was like the height of luxury. I remember seeing that and going, whoa, there's a Star Trek magazine. Like this was like mm -hmm. a whole magazine. It was like a convention in the palm of your hand that you can yeah. just flip through whenever you want. And it just felt like the height of luxury. And I, I got maybe one or two, but I just didn't really have the money, you know, or the... Mm -hmm. Or, or whatever it was to to get them. But I just remember thinking like that it was just such an amazing and wonderful and cool thing. It's so funny to hear that, you know, Sirach, you're like, oh, I had a bunch, you know, I got a whole bunch with me on the cover. And Ben, uh, you obviously were creating this thing and you have them all. But did you know at that point that not only that it was a big thing, but that it would be something that kind of stands the test of time as like, you're 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 creating a time capsule right there. You know, this is what Star Trek and Star Trek fandom looked like in that decade or two. This is what we talked about. This is it's. Did you know you were creating a piece of history? Um, I, I, I knew I wanted to, to do something more ambitious than the stuff that I had seen. So I knew enough about. TV production to know that I thought all the behind the scenes stuff was really interesting and that there were people who people I hadn't talked to. I think what I didn't realize at the time was how many people I would get to do the big interview with who are no longer around. Um, so like doing, you know, we, we did, it was three or four part interview with Matt Jeffries as, as an example. Or, you know, I was looking at some stuff that like the first season of TNG, because I've got a kind of little personal project I'm working on. And you discover that actually, my God, all these people are gone. You know, and I have I did big interviews with people like Herb Wright, or I I got small interviews with people like Maury Hurley, who were very difficult to persuade to talk. Um, but you know, even then, like original series, you'd sort of go, Oh, I'll I'll try and find someone who worked on this and talk to them. And then, you know, in the turn of the century, they were still around. And now they're gone. Yeah. You know, I mean, I don't know, they were, or they're 90. I mean, you know, sometimes you find people and, you know, and once you get into your 90s, your memory is not normally as good as it was. And also these guys were like, oh, yeah, I did an episode of a TV show, which I, you know, yeah, it turned out to be famous. But at the time, I didn't think anything of it. I, I don't remember being on Star Trek. Uh, we'll come back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did I do Star Trek? <laughs> I did actually have, have an interview. I had a very unfortunate interview with one writer who who was beginning to suffer suffering yeah. from a bit of alzheimer's and she literally you know she was talking about stuff and i was thinking you didn't write this episode you know i mean it's so you would come across it a bit yeah. at the time or, or you would come across people who had these kind of crystal clear memories you know people like ben and Nimoy who would be like oh, yeah yeah i remember it was this or it was that but yeah you don't i mean uh, we did uh, did a, a original series book um I was going to say last year, year before last. Um, and I was going through the old interviews and they're like, they're a funny, st I've always loved funny stories. I just think, you know, that's what people want out of life yes. is a 
stupid anecdote. Mm -hmm. And there's a story I'd completely forgotten. And Matt Jeffries told me that when they um, did the episode with the Gorn, they had to get these fake rocks. So they hired these fake rocks from this guy who made lightweight rocks. And they go up there and they're <laughs> filming and they turn around and the dogs have eaten the rocks. And he's like, what's going on? Why have dogs eaten the rocks? And it turned out that the guy had filled these rocks with dog food in order just to make up the weight. <laughs> <laughs> and he's kind of wild inexpensive dogs. and uh biodegradable the rock that the gorn throws at kirk and then he said and the guy wanted the money back for them and he's like going no way you didn't tell us you felt it with <laughs> you know it's so yeah that's that doesn't really answer your question i did i realize it was going to be important did i realize i did i realize it was going to be funny and there was stuff no one had heard before um but you know yeah, ben when you, when you were okay. talking about people recalling their memory um, it, with the exception of those who are under medical, you know, mm. reasons like Alzheimer's, but those people that recall everything, like the details, like Leonard Nimoy, like I know Avery Brooks can do, um, to me, it says something about how deliberate they are in the work that they do and how aware they are mm. while they're doing the work. Some people just, you know, they just show up and, you know, I don't remember what happened, but the ones that really remember the details are the ones to me that are putting so much effort and so much consci consciousness into the work that they do. Would, would you agree? I, I, I think it is true of the ones who do remember that they did that. I don't think it's fair to say that the ones who don't remember didn't necessarily do that. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes there's just so much for them to remember that they right. can't, you know. Um, I, mean, I was talking to Brandon the other day and he's like, oh, help me out, remind me. What was what happened in that episode? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like and they got so much over that at yeah. the time. But there have been so many others that it does. And I also think that about actors, that you know, one of the things for a lot of actors is that you know, I learned how late you guys would get your pages quite often, and that you've got to, you know, you've got to clear yeah. that one out of your mind so you can learn the next set of lines, you know. Um, so I, it's but but yes you're absolutely right the people who have those crystal clear memories it's almost always because they really thought about it you mm -hmm. know and they they didn't just they really engaged and it, it 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 made sense to them i think in a way rather than it was just something that happened mm -hmm. and an emotional connection a lot of times to uh to it if if they had like a, a really strong emotional connection to something it's just a memory that just stays there forever kind of like this one by the way uh everybody listening in i'm pulling up an image <laughs> this is tv guide uh, i can't find the star trek magazine yet but did you know you're on the cover of a tv guide as well sirak <laughs> yeah that was such an honor um especially sharing the, the cover with uh Colomini, who's like a legend um, you know, you never really appreciate the things when they're happening, but in, mm. you know, as you grow older and you mature, you start to realize how, what a special thing it is to be a part of. Um, and in that vein, then I want to ask you about computer generated imagery and the, what contributions, you know, you made in that realm as far as, um, you know, making these models of the, of the sets. Well, so, yeah, there's there's a couple of different kinds of things. So in terms of the show itself and the computer-generated stuff, there's the, Star Trek had this extraordinary thing of, you know, it's 18 years from the, the beginning of yeah. Next Generation to the end of Enterprise. And it's at a time in which the visual effects technology changes beyond recognition. So one of the things I was lucky enough to do is I did a book with Dan Curry about his career on star trek but it turns out like all of these things when they get really interesting is it's not just about dan it, it's about the world and it's about how the world changed so when star trek started they actually were doing something very clever to do with editing on video rather than on film and that made everything possible you could do a ton more that you couldn't do when you actually edited on film you had to you know long complicated process um but on deep space in particular they started to want these really great big battle sequences and mm -hmm. you couldn't do it with physical models it was just like it would take you well you could do it but it would have taken you two <laughs> years you know it's like we have to shoot all of these bits separate all of that so David Stipes um, 
who is a love. Hmm. Are you frozen up for love? No, no. One of the uh, effects. Um, ben, sorry, you, um, you froze up for a really second pushing. there. Ben, can you uh, do those last couple? You, sentences you said Ben. Again? Yeah, you mentioned Ben oh. Stipes right there. Mm -hmm. Got me. Uh, David Stipes. David Stipes. So David. Um, David was one of the important people in the visual effects team, and David was um, pushing to use um, CG um, visuals for making ships. And they, because of the, these great big battles on deep space, so yeah. you know, it's like it was just you needed this extra technology yeah. to do it. And the Star Trek team really kind of invested in it and went for it. Um, and up until that point, I think um, CG effects had looked a little bit flat and plain they look like a video game rather yeah. than mm -hmm. you know like a like a decent effect yeah. but those guys were all uh, um old artisans you know they they understood lighting and all of that kind of stuff and they brought those skills to the cg and made it much more sophisticated than it was and then we were lucky enough because of course we then discovered we're like oh hang on a minute they can make pictures for us really easily um you know, with some <laughs> had like a physical model you had to you know we were trying to do these um you know uh, blueprint type style drawings and with a physical model someone had to study all the different angles and work it out and you know lots mm -hmm. of really complicated maths and stuff and stuff that's way beyond me with the cg we could just say well just render it out for us in a way and we'll trace over it and after a while we thought why are we tracing over this when we just have the perfect picture of the actual thing <laughs> in the first place um so so we started publishing that and then you know that actually those same assets go on to become the basis for the model ships that we did at eagle mars mm -hmm. so that you can literally take the 3d file from the visual effects guys and turn that into a model i mean it's a little mm -hmm. more complicated but you know and it but it means you get things really really accurate you know because you have the perfect reference well i don't know if you noticed but eagle moss was quite a gigantic thing uh amongst the star trek fans and it might be because of the detail with which uh you built these models uh i don't know anything about visual effects I don't know anything about ship models, but I do know that every single person that knows or likes ship models went absolutely ballistic for Eagle Moss and everything about Eagle Moss. Like Sorak and I were always like, well, we we know that it's Eagle Moss. You know what I mean? Like everybody's <laughs> talking about Eagle Moss. We have a friend who has like 300 ships hanging from his yeah. ceiling, Peter Karuba out in San Francisco. All and you know, there's no doubt every single one is Eagle Moss. And he's like, Oh, do you know that in February they're releasing, you know, whatever it is? So you had to know that this was going to be something huge when Eagle Moss was was coming out and was developing. And you had to know that. Well, actually, did you know? You know, take us through um, you never know if anything's gonna be a success. You always, you know. But I mean, you I'm really sure Jack, went for uh, that Jack, exact. They're detail. putting out Avatar two, going. Oh, I hope it's going to work. Um, <laughs> yeah, but it was because you really went to try to make the most exact replica. Like this is exactly what it looks like. Not what we think would look best. Not the cheapest part. But this is the replica model. And the you know these major fans, they're like, just take whatever paycheck I have. And keep doing what you're doing because this is what I love. I mean, what what happened is that we started off. Um, so the, the the kind of business it was it was a, 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 a subscription model um, that is is called a part work. So it's a thing you get in parts, which is what the fact files had been. And the mm. idea was that we the first thing we looked at was a collection of figurines and. I, I don't think I did a particularly brilliant job with them. They were okay, but they weren't they weren't great. Um, and I was learning the robes. And as we were doing them, we used to do market research. So we do focus groups. And it became obvious that what we really should be doing was ships. And I was yeah. I was grateful for ships because ships I, I discovered doing figurines, which I later became pretty good at, is how people don't look the way you think they do. 
and that they are not completely symmetrical and they mm -hmm. are you know there are all sorts of things that require a lot of artistry and interpretation in when you're doing people the great thing about the ships is i was like well i can't get these wrong because i know exactly what they look like right people did i know um so we started doing those and what you discover i think i was uh, it's probably the first time someone who was kind of like a fan first came to mm -hmm. doing something like that you know if you're a toy company or whatever you you make toys and then it's like oh, okay we'll make a star trek one and someone gives you the reference and you you make it, it you're not not got a little, as likely to be someone who's like oh my, that color looks a little bit off i remember it being a bit different color on that and in most of the episodes i mean to give you some examples the re a really good example is the jempadar fighter when you see the the model for that it's really colorful it's like bright purple and blue and you're like this isn't what it looks like on screen mm -hmm. and i knew that straight away because i'd watched every episode many many times and then you know i actually found out why which is to do with the way they were editing it and they dial the color down afterwards because it made it easier for them to like mat it in and stuff um but having that level of knowledge and that ocd kind of quality of of wanting it to be the way it was i think made a real difference um but yeah you never know if it's going to work or not i mean you know they just don't know i mean you you know like, i hope people are going to buy this and then yeah but yes i mean 10 years later you think yeah well it was obvious mm -hmm. <laughs> but it yeah. wasn't at the time <laughs> it definitely wasn't at the time so so ben you know you've worked with so many people i, I read about you know all your collaborations with you mentioned Dan Curry, uh, the Akudas, so many people. Um, where do you see yourself going to next in this space? Ooh, that's a good, fun question. Ooh, difficult. Um, well, it won't be up to me. I mean, it won't be my choice, I'm afraid to say, is the truth. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. It'll be down to somebody else paying for it, which will, um, <laughs> you know, which will be interesting. Um, I mean, right now, I'm working as a consultant with the people who picked up. So a couple of different companies have picked up the old Eagle Moss stuff, and I'm working as a consultant with them to try and get that stuff out. So um, there was we did a big build-up model of the Enterprise D, and there's a company called Diagostini. If you go to fanhome.com, if you have a half-complete model of an Enterprise and you want to finish it, um, go to fanhome.com and sign up and they'll be able to carry on sending you the parts and it was pretty mm -hmm. important to me to, to try and you know i mean i i didn't get it sorted but i kind of i i wanted to stay involved and to to make sure because i felt some kind of responsibility for that even though i wasn't the one who made the company go bankrupt um <laughs> and, and then um there's another company which is masterreplicas.com which is selling the the old stock of all the old little, little eagle moss ships and I, I just kind of felt very i guess very proprietorial about that i i didn't want it to be someone else um you yeah. know it felt like i said i was always an employee but it was my thing you know um so i i was like i don't want this just to to be kind of a mess or dragged out or whatever so i'm very glad they've they've sort of asked for my help in in telling those so um that's happening um <laughs> i have a job um most of my days are taken up working for a very nice book publishing company um and I'm just thinking about the timing of this. Yeah, I think it's yeah. safe to say. So I've been working with Nanar, um, Nanar Visitor, obviously. There are no other Nanars. I don't um, think the better there Nars. Are yeah. book about. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely no other Nars. Um, she has a great story about the fact that um, Avery Brooks was the one who actually asked her how her name was pronounced, which nobody else had ever done. Um, <laughs> yeah. And that uh, is thanks to, yeah. thanks to Mr. Brooks that she is known as Nana by you guys rather than Nana. Um, uh, yeah. But yeah, so it'd been working with her on this this project about Star Trek's uh, portrayal of an influence on women, which has been absolutely fascinating. And I mean, I just sit in the background and listen because, uh, you know, the whole problem has been white, middle aged, privileged men like me um you know telling people how it is so it's been great to just sit in the background and listen and ask the occasional question um so that that'll that'll come out um soon mm -hmm. um 
you know, within the next year or so. And that's at the moment, that's as far as I can see. I mean, there are other things that I, I, I kind of would like to do or, you know, in my, in my laughingly call my spare time. Um, <laughs> I would, I would like to keep working on but i'm not very good at spare time i mean i'm you know not very good at uh life work mm-hmm. balance there is one yeah so uh basically uh everybody that's taken a bunch of notes on everything that ben just said <laughs> basically in ben's star trek world it's a changing landscape weekly things are yeah. developing daily weekly monthly for like the last six months for sure with eagle moss and everything that's going up with the with your book company, your publishing company, all that, it's changing. So how do you keep up on all that? Well, on Twitter, at Ben C.S. Robinson, that's at Ben C.S. Robinson, he will keep you up to date on all of the important things with the models, with the books, with whatever other mind-blowing new thing he's going to come up with. So just follow him there. That's kind of like the hub where he uh, disseminates all that information until whatever the next one happens to be, if you choose to have a different way of doing this. We've only got a couple minutes left, uh, Ben, but can you please tell us, maybe, basically we've scratched the surface on everything. What? How could you condense the elevator pitch? If somebody says, oh, you know Star Trek, what, or you worked in Star Trek, what have you done? Or what do you, what do, you do? What What would you tell people in- I, I kind of, I actually was- I wanted to lobby to become the official historian. That was what I thought. I thought I should just like have it as an honorary post or something. I could be the official Star Trek historian. There are a couple other guys who have every right to to that title as well. But that is kind of what I would love love to be known as is kind of, you know, the Star Trek historian, that guy. Um, The guy with the files, the guy who saw that or read that or went to that. that, That's that's the stuff I really enjoy. You know, that's, can you imagine? You know how, like in in uh, Britain, they have Sir, or you know they have like these <laughs> these titles. Nice. What if Star Trek bestows historian, for example, as a title in front of a, a few select people's names? Like they they dub you with a batleth or something. You know, they say you are now historian Ben Robinson, and that's it. You know, you have yeah. like a, a com badge of your choice tattooed on your chest. And you know Vulcan ears, you know surgically <laughs> implanted, and and you are now a Star Trek history. But I really think that they should do that for a very select few people like yourself. I think that would be really cool. The problem with it is that people would then expect me to know things, and there's always <laughs> there's always the thing they ask you about. You're going, ah, oh, yeah, um, yeah. Either I did once know that and can't remember, or oh, I have no idea. Hmm. Um, I, I I think that. Um... If it hasn't happened already, eventually there will be classes that are taught at university level on mm-hmm. Star Trek and, and and relaying concepts that are discussed and how they are, you know, culturally relevant. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I remember I when I one interview I did with Roxanne, Roxanne Dawson, and she was saying that her daughter had just come back from a medical ethics class. Uh, at university in which they had referenced one of Roxanne's episodes of Voyager beautiful in the one when she was thinking about altering the DNA of her unborn child Mm -hmm. so yeah it definitely happens and I think you realize one of the things I'm working on the project with Nana is you realize that these people have you know how many people have been really influenced by Star Trek and how you know, there are people, there's like Samantha Cristoforetti, who is, I'm not sure if she's there right now, but, you know, commander of the International Space Station, who goes she there. She was up a, there recently. Uh, yeah, well, we talked to her while she was there, and we were down here. Um, <laughs> and she's, you know, she's she's saying, yeah, I was massively inspired by Star Trek. And we talked to loads of people, like astronauts, who were like, yeah, I became an astronaut because of Star Trek. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is a pretty big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That, and uh, Roxanne's daughter, by the way, is a full blown scientist now, and that's and she's very very proud of that. That you know, mommy got to play something 
on TV that inspired so many young women to go into that field, including her own daughter. So, you know, Star Trek really does a lot of things like that. And our good friend, uh, Dr. Muhammad Noor, who's a professor at Duke University, he teaches, uh, obviously, a lot of classes on biology and science, and he infuses Star Trek into a lot of them as well. So it's coming. We're, we're, getting, we're getting closer and closer. Yeah. I think that would be amazing if, yeah, if universities just had not just Star Trek infused into a lesson, but just a lesson on Star Trek completely for the for the whole four six months. That'd be beautiful. Yeah. Oh, anyway, sure there are some cool stuff, right? we'll find it. <laughs> just like I thought I was going to find the uh, cover of the Star Trek magazine with Jake Sisko, and the best I could find was TV Guide. But we'll okay. <laughs> Ben's going to find it. He's Barry, like, you keep talking. Yeah. yeah. He's like, don't well, don't leave it to the amateur. Uh, leave it to the pro to pull it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, yeah. Twenty years ago, so I can't remember which one it is. But again, everybody at home—that's Ben C. S. Robinson. He uh, tweets fairly often. He gives you information on, uh, you know, all the Found old <laughs> uh, on all the old uh, Eagle Moss things and what's happening there. There she is, Colonel I with the Colonel I, hairdo. I, I will send you a picture. I would. Well, okay, great. Eric's got them anyway. I'll find the fact files cover for you. I can do oh, that. Yeah. I'll find your fact files entries and send them to you. Oh, I love, I love it. Um, please sign it too. <laughs> like, I like my stuff autographed, like everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, uh, Ben, thank you so much. This has been thank you, ben. such a delight. We truly loved having you, and can't wait to have you again in some capacity. Uh, to update us on all the new stuff that you are working on and all it's it feels like it's just splintering out into a million different directions and they're all going to grow all of these different bits yeah love it let's see which uh, bits are and thank yeah. you very much everybody at home for joining in the fun we will see you next time on virtual trek con four